morning. I'm Carolyn Rye, Chair of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6.01 p.m. on this 13th day of June 2022. Uh, as always, members, we welcome all of you here in person, and it, it's so great to see this chamber filled with so many of you here uh, with, with much cause for celebration. As always, members of the public will also be able to observe this meeting through live streaming on vbschools.com, broadcast on VBTV channel 47, and on Zoom. With that, Madam Clerk, would you please announce those school board members in attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in school board chambers are Chairwoman Rye, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Felton, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Owens, Ms. Riggs, and Ms. Weems. Thank you. And Mrs. Manning and Mrs. Holtz are on, uh, not with us tonight due to personal reasons. So as many of you are aware, we've had a number of our own Virginia Beach City Public School students die tragically as a result of recent gun violence in the community. I thought it was important that we acknowledge and remember them and their families as I now ask you to join me in a moment of silence. And please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. This evening, the school board has the pleasure of recognizing division students, teams, and staff who have been awarded or recognized during state, multi-state, or national competitions or events. We would like to thank our viewers and guests for their patience this evening as we have several, many recognitions, but we feel it is important to celebrate the many students, staff, and volunteers who make our division strong. With that in mind, we are pleased to announce the school board recognition recipients for June 13th, 2022. Mrs. Hughes. Our first honoree is a student from Bayside High School who received the State Citizenship Award from the Daughters of the American Revolution. Anna Spence, historian of the Francis Land chapter of DAR, states that this award is the highest award a student can receive. This award recognizes and rewards individuals who possess good citizenship qualities of dependability, service, leadership, and patriotism in their homes, schools, and communities. These students are selected by their teachers and peers because they demonstrate these qualities to an outstanding degree. Please, rec <clears throat> sorry. Please welcome Ryan Sauer. Ryan will be graduating this week from Bayside High School. He served as the student body president and received the Diane Anderson Leadership Award for his exceptional character and leadership skills. He was an active member of the National Honor Society and also served as the president of the Gifted Advisory Board. He has served as a role model for all Bayside High School students, and he is sure to see immense success as he continues his educational career at James Madison University in the fall. We are proud of you, Ryan. Okay, our next group of honorees are a joint NJROTC team from Princess Anne and Bayside High Schools. On April 30th, aboard the USS Midway in San Diego, California, the Princess Anne and Bayside NJROTC unit won the NJROTC National Brain Brawl Championship. The Brain Brawl is a Jeopardy style competition where cadets work in teams to answer knowledge-based questions about the Naval Science curriculum. The unit, under the direction of Lieutenant Commander Hauser and Master Chief Guyron, qualified for the competition by previously winning the Area 5 Regional Competition. 
please welcome the members of the Brain Brawl team, and please hold your applause until the end, uh, starting with Austin Zhao from Princess Anne High School, and then Nicholas Morales from Bayside High School, Ella Schofield from Princess Anne High School, Ryan Otto from Princess Anne High School, Kennel Van West uh, from Princess Anne High School, and their mentors, Lieutenant Commander, Lieutenant Commander Jason Hauser, and Master Chief Carlos Guyron. Cadet, you guys beat me to it. <laughs> Cadet Austin Zhao also won the Brawl Stars Individual Competition. By winning this year's national competition, the Princess Anne slash Bayside unit also automatically qualified for next year's NJROTC National Brain Brawl Championships. So congratulations to all of you. We are very proud. And next, we're gonna honor a team of students who became champions in the great game of chess. Old Donation, Old Donation School students competed in the Virginia Scholastic Chess Championship, that's a tongue twister, a scholastic tournament for Virginia students in grades K through 12. The tournament featured eight sections based on grade level and national ch chess rating. Though chess is an individual sport, once two or more players from a school compete in the same section, they become eligible for team trophies. Many of the students won individual trophies or awards in addition to the ODS team trophies. At the competition, Old Donation School saw three of their teams win championship trophies. So let's meet our champions. Please hold your applause until all the students have been recognized. Uh, we have Prahav Mohan, and Jonathan Now, uh, Sitant Yambam, and they were in our state champion K through five team. And now for our first place team, K five, with a rating of U1000, uh, we have Timothy Fuller. Trevor Geddens, Jaden Guo, uh, Ania Jane, and Davika Padir Padiri. And then state champion Blitz team K through five uh, also consists of Timothy Fuller, Jonathan Now, uh, Sifant Yambin, and our team sponsor, uh, Jennifer Gettens, said, all the kids were amazing, and I'm so proud of all of them for all of their hard work and effort. They were truly outstanding representatives of ODS this weekend. And indeed, these students were great representatives of Virginia Beach schools as well. So let's give them a round of applause. Our next honorees are three students who achieved first place in the events at the Technology Students Association State Competition on May 1st, 2022. But due to graduation practice, our honorees aren't here, but we never missed a chance to celebrate our students. I just want you to know that. Um, two advanced Technology Center students achieved first place in board game design, applying leadership in 21st century skills a uh, participant developed, built, and packaged a board game that focused on the subject of their choice. The game was judged on level of interest, uh, visual appeal, and intellectual challenges. Each team designed the packaging, instruction, pieces, and or cards associated with creating and piloting a new board game. 
The two persons team that won the board game design competition included a 10th grade engineer, Technology II student at the ATC, who also attends Ocean Lake High School with a challenging academic schedule. She currently has a 3.70 GPA. Please, let's celebrate Ivani Cotter. <laughs> the second team member is a 12th grade engineering technology two student at the ATC and a senior at Lansdowne High School. She maintains a 4.0 GPA and has been accepted and plans to attend ODU, yes, in the fall. Please celebrate Lavanya O's. We want to send congratulations to Ivani and Lavanya O's. We are so proud of you. Another ATC student placed first in CAD engineering applying leadership and 21st century skills, participant used complex computers, graphic skills, schools and processes to develop a three-dimensional representation of engineering subjects such as machine parts, tool device or manufacturer's products. Our winner is the Engineering Technology II student at the Advanced Technology Center and a senior at Lansdowne High School. He maintains a 4.14 GPA and has been accepted and plans to attend Virginia Tech in the fall. Please, let's celebrate Jackson Spyhard. All three ATC students taught by Michael Torney, engineer technology two instructor and advised by Max Stevens, sponsor of the ATC Technology Student Association. We congratulate Jackson. All you proud, aren't we proud of them all? Give them that hand. Our next honorees are a team of students from the Lansdowne High School Governor's STEM Academy. The students formed a deep sea tactics team and won the Marine Advanced Technology Education MATE Mid-Atlantic Regional Remotely Operated Vehicle Competition on May 14th, 2022 at Old Dominion University, qualifying them to compete at the MATE World Championship at Long Beach City College. This year's MATE competition challenged students to research and engage in the global community by highlighting the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Students had to develop the ability to understand the breadth of business operations, such as finances, research development, and media outreach while learning how to work as a team. Along with developing a business, students also had to work as a team, think critically, and apply technical knowledge and skills in new and innovative ways to successfully build their complex ROV. The following Lansdowne students, each of whom took on specific roles and titles within the group, participated on the victorious team. Please hold your applause until the end, and we are going to ask Daniel Tomov of 11th grade, Chief Executive Officer, Chief Electrical Engineer and Software Engineer, Carter Elliott, 11th grade, Chief Fabrication Engineer and Chief Design Engineer, Trist Tristan Figueroa Reed, 10th grade, Chief Software Engineer, Tara Bell, 9th grade, Fabrication Engineer, Madeline Ennis, 10th grade, Marketing and Lab Safety. Elijah Fisher, 10th grade, Fabrication Engineer. Labib Khan, 10th grade, Software Engineer. Christian Munez, 11th grade, Fabrication Engineer. Nicholas Reichard, 9th grade, Fabrication Engineer. Ruby Neese, 9th grade, Fabrication Engineer. Dylan Sisson, 9th grade, Electrical and Fabrication Engineer. Dom Varner, ninth grade, fabrication engineer. This is the best group of students I've had the privilege of mentoring since Ty Swartz, Deep Sea Tactics me Mentor. I am impressed with their ability to research the complexities of building an ROV and how they work together as an entrepreneurial team. This is everything we encourage students to become. The Lansdowne HS High School ROV team will be heading to Long Beach to compete in the May 2022 ROV World Championships at the end of June. Outstanding work to all of you. Thank you. Great job. So impressive. That is so impressive. Great work to you all. Thank you. <laughs>
Unfortunately, our next honoree, Kelly Nye, could not join us this evening, but we still want to honor her. Kelly was selected by the Virginia PTA as statewide volunteer of the year in the elementary division. So I'm going to tell you right now, as former PTSA president, that means a lot of hours. Kelly is a volunteer at Glenwood Elementary School, and the Virginia PTA recognized her for being an influence on students, families, and her school community in a positive way on a daily basis, and for voluntarily undertaking service and duty to make every child's potential a reality. David French, a principal at Glenwood, stated of Kelly, Kelly dedicates her time to do any and everything she can to help Glenwood students in any way. She constantly works with Glenwood administration and staff to find ways that she can support her school. Her positive attitude and willingness to help is contagious and appreciated. Thank you so much, Kelly, for your service to our schools. Our next two recognitions are for our citywide volunteers of the year. First, our 21-22 primary schools volunteer of the year was selected from all of the individual elementary school volunteers of the year. This year's honoree recognized a major challenge her PTA faced during the course of the pandemic. While many businesses turned online to continue operations, the PTA lacked the technological ability for school volunteers to effectively serve the community collaborate with each other, and securely share files. This volunteer spent months over the summer building a robust, tech-centered foundation on which the PTA could thrive and serve the community. With a budget of zero, she was able to utilize her computer background to obtain the best business collaboration and organizational tools available through a partnership with Google for nonprofits. This comprehensive foundation will benefit the PTA for many years to come. From budget planning to expense tracking to project collaboration spaces, the system is easy to use and focuses limited resources on what matters, the needs of students, family, and staff. This year's Primary Schools Volunteer of the Year is Meg Castle from Malibu Elementary School. Thank you, Meg, for all you do for our students and staff, and congratulations. And now on to the Secondary Schools Volunteer of the Year. This volunteer was selected from all of the middle and high school volunteers of the year. This year's honoree can often be found at her school in the early morning and late night hours supporting fundraising efforts, preparing for events, and working with partners to provide recognitions for teachers, bus drivers, security staff, counselors, and of course, students. For the past five years, she has ensured that all of the students feel appreciated and recognized for their hard work on reflections, bringing up grades, and on graduating the eighth grade, which was celebrated with the cruise on the Spirit of Norfolk and more recently with the drive-by celebration. Through, yeah, I tried not to. <laughs> oh gosh. Through her hard work and dedication, she has helped the PTA and school earn various honors through participating in citywide PTA reflections, achieving 100% staff membership, and even earning the exemplary PTA award. This year's Secondary Schools Volunteer of the Year is Elizabeth Johnson from Larkspur Middle School. <clears throat> Making sure they get those pictures. Thank you, Elizabeth, for all you do for our students and staff, and a well-deserved congratulations to the both of you. This evening, we are proud to recognize the Virginia Beach Education Association Teacher Assistants of the Year. The elementary honoree is a special education teacher assistant who works with multiple grade levels, sharing her devotion to education and positive energy with students and staff. She is highly respected and valued as a hard worker who is willing to step in whenever and, and wherever she is needed. In school, she serves on the principal's advisory committee and works with the SCA. She also serves the community through her participation in Salem High School's Family Voice Group 
fundraising for Salem's Visual Arts Academy, supporting Autism Awareness Month, and volunteering at her church. Please welcome Kristen Euler from Tallwood Elementary School. Lisa Suter, principal at Tallwood Elementary, says of Kristen, she is one of the most outstanding assistants I have ever worked with. She is a hard worker and willing to step in whenever and wherever she is needed, often doing what needs to be done before I have reached out to ask. Another colleague said, as a special education assistant, she takes the job of educating children very seriously and is able to engage students no matter their educational setting and ensure they work towards their academic goals. Kristen, we are so proud of you. <laughs> the secondary honoree <clears throat> is a special education assistant who cares deeply for her students and her school. She works with the special transportation students and drivers, ensuring everything runs smoothly. Her work in the AAF classroom supports students with their IEP goals and VAAP binders. She accompanies her students on community-based instructional field trips, and she developed a school coffee shop where students practice communication and other life skills. For the community, Kimberly developed the Fitness Fund for Special Needs Friends Club, providing kids with special needs and their families from across the city an opportunity to learn more about physical fitness in a fun way. Please welcome Kimberly Hylinski. Kimberly works at Independence Middle School. Kenneth Vaughn, the principal at Independence, says Kimberly is the most, most dedicated teacher assistant I have ever worked with or heard of. She has had a huge impact on her school's special transportation students and drivers communicating with them so that everything runs smoothly. smoothly. One bus driver says she has renewed her desire to continue driving special transportation for her school, and I'm quoting, that says a lot. <laughs> And then added that the only flaw is that there are no duplicates of her because that sure would be a blessing. Kimberly, we are very proud of you. Our next honorees are two students from the Advanced Technology Center who placed second in the nation, not the state, second in the United States of America, <laughs> in the American Society of Materials, or ASM, Materials Challenge 2022 for high school students. Please welcome Kyle Purser, an 11th grade ATC student who also attends Kempsville High School, and Aaron Brooks, an 11th grade ATC student who also attends Lansdowne High School. Both students are in the ATC Engineering Technology One course taught by Jason Baker. The ASM Materials Challenge for Students challenges high, for students challenges high school students interested in materials engineering to either build a testing device for materials, build a measurement device for materials, or compare the qualities of different types of construction, such as arches and bridges. Students had to create a photo journal of the process, create a three-minute video targeted toward middle school students, and write a two-page essay about the project. The reward for second place was $150 for each student and the entry into the William Hunt Eisenman Materials Camp at the ASM headquarters in Cleveland, Ohio. The camp is valued at $2,000 per person, and only 30 students in the whole country are selected for this camp. Nice. Congratulations, Kyle and Aaron. We are proud of you and excited for you. Our final recognition is for our Sister Cities Student Ambassador. The mission of Sister Cities Association of Virginia Beach is to promote world peace through people-to-people -people relationships a municipality sharing Virginia Beach's sister cities 
or Moss, Norway, Miyazaki, Japan, North Down, Bangor, Ireland, Alongapo City, Philippines, and Weiblingen, Germany. We also have a friendship city, San Juan del Sur, Nicaragua. We are proud of our sister city relationships and continue to work toward our mission of fostering international understanding, friendship, and cooperation. Recognizing the importance of providing our youth with experiences in international affairs and diplomacy, the Sister Cities Youth Ambassador Program was created to showcase the skills and talents of globally minded youth. The role of the Sister City Youth Ambassador is an important one as we continue to increase youth participation and expand our membership base. Students are selected as Sister City Youth Ambassadors after modeling cultural attire, presenting a global platform, performing a talent, and engaging in an impromptu interview. The selected Youth Ambassador receives a scholarship to the university of their choice and enjoys many opportunities to represent the City of Virginia Beach. Such, such as the recognition by city council and appearances at sister city events, such as the Cherry Blossom Festival, the Fell Fest, and the Norwegian Lady Commemorative Ceremony. This year, the student selected as the sister city student ambassador is Lucia Morton. Lucia is currently a junior at Kempsville High School in the Entrepreneurship and Business Academy. She has a 4.14 GPA and continuously receives honor roll or principals list each semester. She is highly involved at Kempsville High School and in the community. Lucia is a member of the track and field team where she was recognized as the highest point earner this season for outdoor track and field. She is also the junior class president and will be senior class president next year. Lucia also serves as citywide SCA secretary and is the founder and president of the Global Food Society. In addition, Lucia is the vice president of the Technology Student Association at Kempsville and received third place in the state level competition for AutoCAD architecture. Lucia is also a co-founder of World Play a business founded within the Incubator Edu course of the Academy. She plans to intern with the Wednesday's youth program where she hopes to help with curriculum writing and developing youth programs for the community. After high school, she plans to study aerospace engineering and is looking at the University of Michigan to further her studies. Congratulations, Lucia. We are so proud of you. This concludes the recognitions for this meeting. Again, congratulations to everyone who was recognized tonight. Isn't she? And she came and spoke to us too. Oh, was that? She did. She spoke she to me and to Barry. She spoke to us about um, the thing with the uh, immigration immigrants that Vicki had said something about that once became so. She's a, she could really speak well. I mean, she's amazing. Okay, that leads us to uh, agenda adoption. Agenda item eight. Oh no, I'm sorry. No, yes. Okay. So as noted earlier in, in workshop, uh, there's one, one uh, adjustment to the agenda, the, uh, the presentation for professional development and up, that update will be now uh, it has been deferred and we're going to add it to agenda item 17. Are there any other changes to the agenda? And we're just, and we will, and I'm noting that the board will go into closed session as well following that. So with that, motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs and a second. 
Mrs. Ms. Owens. All right, all in favor, show a raised hand, please. Madam Chair, we have nine ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, no superintendent report this evening, so we will move to approval of the meeting minutes for May 24th, 2022. Any modifications to these minutes? Okay. Hearing none, a motion to approve. Mrs. Franklin and a second, Mrs. Hughes. All in favor, show a raised hand, please. We have nine ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. So that brings us to the public comments portion of the meeting. And the board will now entertain comments on matters relevant to pre-K to 12 public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and school division from citizens and delegations who signed up with the clerk prior to noon today. Persons not called to the podium are requested to be respectful of speakers so that the board and persons observing the meeting are, are able to hear and observe each person's comments. Persons will be called up to speak three at a time. Uh, for speakers who are outside chambers, uh, you will be asked to line up in person. Student speakers will be called first, followed by speakers participate. student speakers participating through Zoom. Each, we ask that each speaker begin speaking once their name is called, and you have three minutes to present, and you'll be given a 30-second warning before time expires. Uh, we ask that you uh, refer to the time tracker to keep track of your time. Once your time has expired, we kindly ask that you uh, cease remarks, leave the podium, and allow the next speaker who can be queued to speak. Uh, speak. If a speaker is not present when called to speak or is not online or unable to mute, the school board at its sole discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of the public comments session and members of the audience will not be recognized to assist an online speaker with making online comments. As always, the school board invites the public to submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. And with that, Madam Clerk, would you please introduce our first speaker of the evening? Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first speaker will be Bobby Ray Huntley, then Larry LeMasters, and then Greg Furlick. Good evening. Good evening. Greetings, everyone. My name is Reverend Bobby Huntley. I am recently, excuse me, I recently retired on October the 1st, 2021, after 19 years with the Virginia Beach City Public Schools. I worked as a security assistant, in-school suspension coordinator, and dean of students slash work adjustment teacher. During my tenure for 14 years, I was the director of the Gentlemen's Club a character development mentoring program for youth that met year round after school. The Gentlemen's Club program was implemented at Plaza Middle, Lanstown, Kempsville Middle, and Virginia Beach Central Alternative High School. With every implementation of the program, the following year, we started the Ladies Club program. A few of the things that members learned and participated in, how to tie a necktie, proper dining and etiquette class, salsa dance, fashion shows, field trips and football games, and basketball games. We toured college campuses, Virginia Beach Courthouse and Jail, and even chartered a bus to Washington, D.C. to tour the White House. It is because of our overall success, the program received national attention. Our members were invited to be a part of the panel to speak at the Promise Keepers Dropout Summit in Richmond, Virginia. In addition to that, members, along with their parents, were also invited to Washington, D.C. to participate in a National Association of State Boards of Education there in Washington, D.C. School districts in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Connecticut, and Maryland reached out to us wanting to learn about our program with hopes of starting their very own program. The Gentlemen's Club program has been featured in Dr. Merrill's Compass 2015 and Dr. Spence Compass 2020. Years ago, I was asked about the program if it was a black program. My response, it's not a black program, nor is it a white program, but it is the right program. The Gentlemen's Club program has been proven and credited with doing the following, being the right program to change the climate of schools in a positive way, the right program to reduce 
referrals by 50 percent, the right program to reduce disciplinary actions by 50 percent, the right program to reduce in-school dropouts or high school dropouts, the right program to detour students from joining gangs, the right program to increase attendance, the right program to increase high school graduations, and the right program to help close the achievement gap. And over the years, I've received several calls from parents wanting this program to be implemented in their school. I reached out to the current superintendent and the former superintendent with wanting to have this program implemented in every school. Seconds. To this day, I regret not being able to make this happen. Now, unfortunately, the program no longer exists in any of the Virginia Beach City Public Schools. So I'll leave you with this. My new book entitled The Shaping of Our Future Generation, putting a plug in the school to prison pipeline. Available at all bookstores, my website, Amazon.com, and I have a book signing coming up this Saturday at the, uh, uh, the Book Exchange in Virginia Beach. God bless you. Our next speaker is Larry LeMasters. Greg Furlick and Kamani Vaughn. Greg Furlick. Welcome. Good evening, Dr. Spence, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, and members of the school board. My name is Greg Furlick. I'm a 30-year employee of Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and I'm the current principal of Rosemar Forest Elementary School. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'd like to begin by expressing my appreciation to the board for the support you have shown both teachers and administrators over the years. Time and again, you have dealt with contentious issues without ever losing your focus on doing what is best for students and staff, and I commend you all for this. I come tonight to ask for your support yet again. Over the past several years, we have all seen the coarsening of public commentary, and you have all had a front row seat and witnessed your share of vitriol that crosses the line of what ought to be acceptable in a, in a polite society. As school leaders, we too, and I have some behind me here, have been on the front lines, and we have handled situations that just a few years ago would have been unimaginable. We do so with the understanding that it is a necessary part of the work that we do, and it goes with the job. One thing that should not be part of the job, however, is for malicious commentary that targets employees to find a wider audience. One way the board can help us is by reviewing the policy that allows members of the public to come before the board and defame school board employees by name. These comments are recorded. There is no review of their accuracy. They become part of the public record. They can be viewed repeatedly on the division's website. When this happens, as school board employees, we have no ability to answer for ourselves, no chance to refute false allegations, and no opportunity to correct the record or restore our reputations. We are public servants. We do this job because we love our kids, and we are passionate about public education. At the end of the day, however, we are also husbands, wives, fathers, and mothers. We go to t-ball games and coach volleyball. We go to church and do volunteer work. We live in the community. When unfounded comments are shared in a public forum, our lives, not just our work lives, are negatively affected. To be clear, we value accountability and assure you this adjustment would not compromise it. We will remain accountable for our actions and the division will continue to properly investigate all concerns. We are requesting your help so that we can be at our best when representing our schools. Therefore, I ask tonight that you continue the fine job you have done in supporting the employees of this division by restricting public commenters from referring to school board employees. 30 by name. seconds. I thank you for your consideration and have a good evening. Our Just next speaker a, 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 is Kamani Vaughn, then Paige Shear. A, a friendly reminder to please uh, withhold applause. Thank you all. And good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the board, and Dr. Spence. My name is Kimani Vaughn, and I'm a proud principal in what I've considered to be one of the finest school divisions. I'm a product of Virginia Beach, and I have proudly served our community for over 16 years. These past few years have been undoubtedly one of the most challenging periods of education. On behalf of the Virginia Beach Association of Elementary School Principals, I'd like to thank you for your continued support through these difficult times. When we needed resources during the pandemic, you and senior leadership acted to provide those resources to keep our students and our faculty safe. 
You heard the cries of teachers for more time to plan as they navigated their way through virtual learning. By listening and acting to support, you enable teachers to not miss a beat in providing VBCPS students the best possible education under increasingly stressful times. You also limited professional learning during the pandemic. That's just one more example of how you have worked to respond to the needs of staff in the critical shortages that we have faced. These examples are a few reasons why we're so thankful for your support. As leaders in the division, however, we find ourselves in need of asking for your support once more. We are asking that you read and consider our concerns regarding the current practice of allowing televised speakers to share individual names of staff members and express slanderous opinions and unsubstantiated accusations. While we respect and value the need for public input, actions such as speaking falsely and naming an employee have long reaching implications for the named party and their reputation. The division has appropriate outlets for investigating concerns in a professional manner. This type of action negatively impacts our ability to successfully lead and perform the job to which we have dedicated ourselves. We must ensure our students have the highest quality educators leading and supporting them. In order to attract and retain, we must ensure our employees are treated with respect and have the necessary support from the board. Thank you in advance for your consideration of our concerns and for your continued support. Please hear our plea to stop the defaming and public shaming of VBCPS staff. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paige Shear. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the board, Dr. Spence, and senior staff. My name is Paige Shear, and I'm the proud principal of Virginia Beach Middle School. This year, it has also been my privilege to serve as president of the Virginia Beach Association of Secondary School Principals, representing over 140 administrators in VBCPS. For the past 27 months, we have been through an unprecedented situation that none of us asked for or wanted. It was or has, without a doubt, been the most challenging time of our careers. You have listened to staff members throughout the year as circumstances changed and provided support in a myriad of ways that my colleagues referenced earlier. Although the pandemic had a terrible impact on education, VBCPS in comparison to other divisions across the nation was prepared to weather this storm because of the leadership of this board and senior staff. You made a commitment years ago to one-to-one -one technology which put us ahead of the curve. The work of the Departments of Teaching and Learning and Technology and implementing a learning management system and moving curriculum and resources online made the transition to a virtual setting as seamless as it could possibly be. As we returned to face-to-face -face instruction, all of you served as a source of strength, shouldering many burdens, leaving us free to do what we do best, take care of our kids and our staff. Words are really inadequate to express how grateful we are for your support. Each and every day, staff members walk into school buildings across the division, eager to make a positive difference in the lives of the students they serve. At times, administrators must make decisions that align with school board policy, which individuals do not always agree with. We must be able to do our jobs without fear of being subject to unvetted accusations in a public forum. I don't have to tell you the crisis we currently face as it relates to staffing shortages. Division employees are not elected officials. We came to VBCPS because of our love for children and our desire to work for an exemplary school division that values its employees. In doing this, we did not sign up for our reputations to be placed at risk through unsubstantiated public accusations. We are asking for your support in seizing this practice. Our request should seconds. not diminish the value we place on the strong relationships we have cultivated with our families and community partners. They are central in the important work we do. It should also not be mistaken for avoidance of accountability when warranted. The division has a multitude of systems in place to address concerns, and we urge the board to lean on these systems rather than allowing unvetted accusations to be aired publicly. Thank you very much for hearing our concerns. Speaker number six asked to be removed, so we'll go to Lisa Varga, Kelly Miller, and then Jeffrey Bates. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, school board members, and Dr. Spence. My name is Lisa Varga. 
For months, I have watched school board meetings and followed news stories about material selection and instructional materials and proposed changes and reconsideration and appeals and have been incredibly disappointed with what I have seen happen here in Virginia Beach. I recognize that a lot of what has been said about books in this room and online are part of a larger attack against education. And every time I see proposals and objections put forth by some of the people on this board, I recognize that responding to them only adds to their chaos and the enjoyment over the confusion they are causing. But that chaos and confusion is harmful, especially to our students. So before I go on, let me make this clear. I support parents and caregivers' rights to have input on what their children read. I cannot support a group of parents influencing policy that restricts what other parents might want their children to read. For more information about that, you can see what the National Coalition Against Censorship and 17 other organizations recently had to say about this topic and Virginia Beach. My foremost concern is the well-being of all members of the community. Toxic rhetoric about libraries, librarians, and even booksellers makes me particularly concerned for the safety of those individuals. Veiled threats aimed at these audiences make people feel fearful to speak up even when misinformation is being disseminated. For 25 years, I have been a librarian. I am the executive director of the Virginia Library Association, which represents more than 5,000 librarians and library workers here in Virginia. I have done this job for my home office here in Virginia Beach since 2011. I have seen book challenges all over the country in all kinds of circumstances, none of which have been as politically motivated as what is happening here in Virginia Beach right now. Over the years, all of the book challenges I have seen boil down to one personality characteristic on the part of the petitioner. Complainants often have lost control of something in their personal professional lives and act out by thinking they can control what people read. Their accusations against books or media often say more about who those people are than they do about the books they are opposed to. The same is happening here. After two years of a loss of control of so many things due to the pandemic, we have a small group making a lot of noise about books. And not just about books, but about librarians and educators. The use of the words like grooming and indoctrination in reference to books are purposely antagonizing and insult and diminish people who have actually been groomed and indoctrinated. I've also recently seen a school board member has submitted a book rating system to the Policy Review Committee, and I hope there will be opportunity for public comment and legal review. The system is flawed, problematic, and a potential infringement on the intellectual freedom of students. I know exactly which parts of these three minutes will be taken out of context and manipulated with people who disagree with me. That is their prerogative, and I would never tell someone they can't express themselves. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kelly Miller, then Jeffrey Bates. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, school board members, and Dr. Spence. My name is Kelly Miller, and I'm the coordinator of library media services for the district. I know that you heard from several of our school librarians, students, and parents at the last school board meeting. They shared some of the important work librarians do in addition to purchasing and checking out books. Librarians are one of the few people in schools that work with every teacher and every student. Our librarians collaborate and co-teach with language arts teachers, content teachers, instructional technology specialists, gifted resource specialists, and others. In collaboration, librarians share ways to integrate all literacies, including informational and media. They also support reading in reading skills by providing independent reading experiences for all students. The American Association of School Librarians provides data that shows that schools with certified librarians have higher student achievement, higher test scores, and higher reading scores. As we know, our students' mental health status is becoming increasingly important since the pandemic. Librarians have in the past and will continue to support the mental health of our students by providing a safe environment physically and emotionally. They see the students who feel unseen and the students who do not feel like they fit in anywhere. They also build relationships with all students that are important to everybody's mental health status. I recently visited a high school librarian where a student in a writing assignment included her librarian as one of the most important people in the building 
because of the librarian's kindness, her attention, and her ability to make the student feel seen and heard. In another high school, the librarian who noticed a student's mood change over time spoke with a student who acknowledged he was struggling and arranged for the appropriate mental health along with the guidance counselor. Librarians provide student support outside of the library as well by being coaches, club sponsors, class sponsors, and even graduation coordinators. As we, 30 seconds. As we end the school year and begin summer, our librarians will continue to be a hub of activities for the students attending summer school and for the teachers that are also teaching there. They will continue librarians to experience professional development, read literature to support our students, and begin planning for the next school year. One of the best parts of my job is to visit libraries and see students excited to be there and they are engaged in there and learning. I encourage you to experience the same pleasure And that is I time. Do. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeffrey Bates. Good evening. Good evening. Madam Chair, Ryan, other council members, <coughs> Superintendent um, Spence. My name is Jeffrey Bates. I moved to Virginia Beach from California in 1983. I have three adult children who have finished um, Virginia Beach school system and three grandchildren that are currently attending. I was appointed by the former mayor, Myron Overdorf, and served as his chairman along with my good friend, Dr. Brian Matley, Matney from Virginia Beach Crime Task Force. I volunteered 14 and a half years with the Virginia Beach Juvenile Court Division, along with supervising those young ones who found themselves on the other side of the law. I served 26 years in the military. I worked with uh, Virginia Beach School Division as an educator for six years. Um, I was a member of the Compass 2015 Committee and one of the original members of Virginia Beach Equity Council. Um, I mentored at the um, Renaissance Academy, but this is not about me. <clears throat> I come to address the issue of putting students first and meaning it, not just in words, but in true action. To get to the point, many ideas and surveys have been taken about one thing or another concerning the educating of our children in this current world um, environment. We see that gun violence and other acts of disruptions around us, and there has been less respect for others. This brings me to the Gentleman's Club that Mr. Bobby Huntley spoke of. This is a perfect tool to address and correct some of the issues we see with some of our young people today. When I was growing up, good manners was the order of the day. Um, and that's one thing that I express in my classroom. When we cannot, but we cannot talk about godly values because it's taboo. Teaching good manners, politeness, along with respect is what Mr. Huntley's program is all about. Um, I had a group and my group was called the Young Men of Vision. What's puzzling is that Virginia Beach could showcase this program around the country was with this interviews, seconds. but the school division powers to be would not expand it throughout its own school division. I would like to know why. This program would save a lot of the stuff that we see going on in our society today. I'm just curious, why wasn't this program picked up and expanded throughout the division? Thank you for your time and consideration. Madam Chair, that was our last speaker for this evening. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So with no information items this evening, we are proceeding to the consent agenda. A, resolution Juneteenth, B, policy review recommendations, one, policy 379, schedules, routes and stops, activity buses, 
B2, policy 421, payment to the estate of deceased employees earned an accrued leave. B3, policy 61, mission statement and vision statement. B4, policy 62, goals and objectives. B5 is policy 6-8, con controversial issues. B6 is policy 610, guest speakers. B7 is policy 611, no child left behind. B8 is policy 614, emergency drills and planning. B9 is policy 615, delayed opening, emergency closing of schools. B10, policy 6-61, instructional material selection. Then we have C, religious exemptions. D, the new course data science and E, school board organizational matters to include one, the superintendent's designee in the absence of the superintendent, two, the superintendent's signature authority, and three, payroll deductions. So with that, I call for a motion to approve these consent agenda items as presented. Uh, Mrs. Riggs and second, Mrs. Felton. All in favor, a raised hand, please. We have nine ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. So now the action. Madam Chair, did you want to have um, the resolution read for Juneteenth? I beg your pardon. Mrs. Felton, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Resolution, Juneteenth, June 13th. 2022, whereas Juneteenth commemorates the day freedom was proclaimed to all enslaved people in the South by the Union General Gordon Granger, who arrived in Galveston, Texas, proclaiming the authority of the United States over Texas in the name of then President Andrew Johnson on June 19, 1865, more than two and a half years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation by President Abraham Lincoln. And whereas not caring so much to which day of freedom had come as to the fact it had come, the freed men and women referred to this day as Juneteenth, which provide the historical reference for Juneteenth National Freedom Day, also known as Emancipation Day, Emancipation Celebration and Freedom Day to commemorate the June 19, 1865 announcement of the abolition, the ab abolishment of slavery in the state of Texas and in general, the emancipation of enslaved African Americans throughout the Confederacy. And whereas Americans of all ethnic backgrounds, creed, cultures, and religions share in a common love and respect for freedom, as well as a determination to protect their rights to freedom, the freedom to choose a life direction, man of earning a livelihood and creating a community which a free people live with dignity. And whereas, although remembering and celebrating Juneteenth promotes the unique lie, lived experience, plight and persistent of African-American, African and people, black people, and also provides an opportunity for those not of this demographic to seek knowledge and awareness, obtain skills necessary to interact and communicate in a global society, and to learn from the past to better serve all current and future generation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Virginia Beach City Public School Board observe Juneteenth and other months of cultural represents as the first step to acknowledging our core values and commitment to advance educational equity, cultural competency, and accountability. And be it fully resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopted by the board of the city of Virginia Beach this 13th day, June 2022. Thank you, Mrs. Felton. Okay. So now on to action. We have the personnel report and administrative appointments. 
Uh, motion to approve. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, first motion. Mrs. Franklin and second Mrs. Weems. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, um, please show your approval with a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have nine ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. And our chambers, which was emptied out moments earlier, <laughs> it is now <laughs> mysteriously filled again with, with m many more things to celebrate. So with that, I turn it over to Dr. Spence. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Yes, I'd like to start with uh, asking Jennifer Bourne to please stand up. Now, you all would recognize uh, Ms. Bourne. She was a teacher at Luxford Elementary School, taught at Bayside Middle School, served as an assistant principal at Kemp's Landing Magnet School at SeaTac Elementary School, and then as principal at Providence Elementary and Thalia Elementary. She was for a bit the director of the Office of Compensatory Programs and Remediation and Curriculum and Instruction, then went to be again principal at Indian Lakes Elementary School, came over here to help us out in human resources, is currently serving as a human resource specialist in staffing in the Department of Human Resources. And we're really thrilled that she wanted to go back and you are accepting our recommendation for her to serve um, as the next principal at Rosemont Elementary School. Congratulations. And would you like to introduce your guests? Next, I would like to uh, recognize Amy O'Connor. Ms. O'Connor, if you please stand up. Oh, all right. Um, you, uh, so, so Ms. O'Connor has served, <laughs> throw me off, <laughs> as a teacher at Great Bridge Primary and Camelot Elementary Schools in Chesapeake. She served as a teacher in San Diego, a literacy support specialist in the Department of Defense. She's been a teacher at Luxford Elementary School, most recently has been serving as a reading specialist at Arrowhead Elementary School and administrative assistant at Birdneck Elementary School. And we're pleased this evening that you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next assistant principal at Bayside Elementary School. Congratulations. <laughs> I think you have some guests with you. <laughs> Next, I'd like to ask Bryce Mitchell to please stand up. Mr. Mitchell has served as an instructional assistant in Virginia, as a teacher assistant in Winchester Public Schools, a teacher in Winchester Public Schools, and has been serving here in Virginia Beach as a teacher at Larkspur Middle School. And we're thrilled this evening that you've accepted our recommendation for him to serve as the next assistant principal at Great Neck Middle School. Congratulations. <laughs> and I think you may have some guests. If I could ask Kenneth Walsh to please stand up. Mr. Walsh has served as a senior personnel analyst, a human resources associate, a human resources manager, a member of a school board in Greece, New York, a teacher at Lucille Brown Middle School in Richmond Public Schools, most recently has been serving here as a teacher at Brandon Middle School, and we are very pleased that you have accepted our recommendation for Mr. Walsh to serve as the next assistant principal at Independence Middle School. Congratulations. And do you have guests with you? <laughs> Mr. Walsh, I'm, I'm not going to provide a lot of evaluation early on in the careers in AP, <laughs> but I suggest you go white first next time. Okay. Just saying. Oh, uh, if I could, I'm sorry. 
Uh, Jennifer Clements, if I could ask her to please stand up. Uh, you all recognize her. She has served as a teacher, I know we're excited, at Hickory High School. She has served in New York as a teacher. She has served as a library media specialist in New York. Most recently has been serving as the library media specialist at First Colonial High School. And we are very pleased that you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next coordinator for instructional technology in the Department of Teaching and Learning. Congratulations. And you have guests with you as well. I'd like to ask Matthew Delaney to please stand up. Don't, don't you want to know what he's going to do? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Delaney has uh, not only a classmate of mine and a fellow graduate of Green Run High School in 1989, also has served here with distinction in Virginia Beach as a teacher at Princess Anne High School, an assistant principal at First Colonial High School, Salem High School, as a principal at Larkspur Middle School and Salem High School, most recently, at, and then also executive director of secondary teaching and learning in the Department of Teaching and Learning, most recently has been serving as the senior executive director of high schools in the Department of School Leadership. We're very, very pleased this evening that you've accepted our recommendation for him to serve as the next chief schools officer in the Department of School Leadership. <laughs> Matt, do you have guests with you? Yes, thank you, Mrs. You have to stand. Come on. <laughs> if I could ask uh, Rashida Moore Williams to please stand up. Ms. Moore Williams has served here in Virginia Beach as a teacher at Lansdowne High School, a school counselor at Lansdowne High School. She has served as an assistant principal at Virginia Beach Middle School. Most recently has been serving as assistant principal at Salem Middle School. And we're pleased this evening that you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next assistant director at the Advanced Technology Center. Congratulations to you. And I didn't know if you had guests with you this evening. I think your husband couldn't make it. That's okay. We're glad you're here. And um, if I could just, uh, one, uh, one point of just personal uh, privilege, if, if you don't mind, um, be, the reason that Mr. Delaney is going to be serving as the next chief schools officer, and I know he's going to be mad at me for doing it, but I'm going to do it anyway, <laughs> yes. is because Dr. Gene Saltner will be retiring here at the end of the summer. You all know his service. I don't need to go through his resume. He is a leader amongst leaders who has mentored more leaders in this division and across the Commonwealth than we could possibly name. And so we just want to give our sincere thanks to you, Dr. Sultner, for your leadership. Congratulations to you. I will, I will pay for that later. <clears throat> So um, thank you, Madam Chair. That, that is all. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Okay, folks, we now have uh, action item B is salary, a salary resolution for fiscal year 22-23. And Vice Chair Mrs. Malik, would you kindly read the, the resolution? Certainly. 
<clears throat> Whereas the mission of the Virginia Beach City Public Schools in partnership with our entire community is to ensure that each student is empowered with the knowledge and skills necessary to meet the challenges of the future. And whereas the school board has adopted a comprehensive strategic plan and school improvement priorities to guide budgetary decision, decisions. And whereas the school board has studied the recommended school operating budget in view of state and federal requirements, additional demands for space and operations, the strategic plan, priorities, expectations, competitive compensation for employees, and the best educational interests of its students. And whereas the school board proposed operating budget has been reconciled to meet the funding from the city council. And whereas all employees will receive a 4.5% cost of living adjustment and an additional 0.5% step increase. And whereas the instructional experience based and unified experience based step pay scales, part time hourly rates, table of allowances, high school department chairs, non athletic supplements, athletic supplements, and student activity rates titled below and as shown in the attachments are approved and will be effective as shown below. And whereas the percent of compensation increases and the effective dates of the increases are shown below. Attachment A, alphabetical listing of instructional positions. Attachment B, instructional experience based step pay scale, July 1st, 22 through June 30th, 23. Attachment C, unified experience based step pay scale grade assignments. July 1st, 22 to June 30th, 23. Attachment D, Unified Experience Based Step Pay Scale, July 1st, 22 to June 30, 23. Attachment E, Part Time Temporary Hourly Rates, July 1st, 22 to 6 30, 23. Attachment F, Table of Allowances, school year 22-23, attachment G, high school department chairs and non-athletic and athletic supplements, school year 22-23, attachment H, student activity rates, school year 22-23. Now therefore, let it be resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach adopts the salary scale and the compensation increases as outlined in this resolution and attachments adopted by the school board this 13th day of June, 2022. Thank you, Mrs. Melnick. So motion to approve the salary resolution. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Ms. Owens, any discussion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor, please show a raised hand. We have nine ayes, the motion did pass. Thank you. Action item C, policy review recommendation. We have a single recommendation this evening, uh, policy 3-85, outside food and drink in schools and classroom. Uh, a motion to approve. Mrs. Weems, a second. Mrs. Anderson, discussion. By the policy review committee, uh, we made some minor tweaks to that. And after speaking with John Sutton, you had indicated that if it was okay that we answered your questions, we brought it back to you rather than taking it back through information. So we answered, provide the questions for you. Um, I believe your questions had to do with, if I'm correct, in the outside food in the second paragraph, they put in the Oh, sorry, about the guidelines for the food and beverages. I'm not sure if there are any further questions you have about this policy. I'm happy to read it again. The entire policy would be new, as we mentioned before. This is a new for us. So you'd be adopting the entire new policy. And I'm not sure if the policy review committee members have any further guidance on this, but this looks significantly similar to the last time you saw it. Mrs. Riggs? What were the uh, changes that we asked at the board meeting at the last one? Could you just read um, that section so I we could I hear that? I think I did not highlight it. Um, I think we put a section on there. I thought it had, if I'm correct, it was B, section B on the referred to the food and beverage guidelines document. There was a question whether it had been attached. We were talking about the policy review committee. Mm -hmm. So that would be the second paragraph. Uh -uh. 
I think it was B. It was, I think the big issue was B, and it was the word discouraged. It was, yes. the, it was oh, the I'm sorry. Yes, that is, yes. Sorry, that is the scratch out word yes. there also. Mm -hmm. So can you read that? that yes. Part and that's Thank you. slightly longer. This is the last sentence in paragraph B. Therefore, outside food and or drink brought into a classroom school setting by parents, legal guardians, volunteers, students, or staff members for holidays, celebrations, and rewards that is intended to be shared with other students during the school days shall be, and we struck it out, uh, rare and approved, so in other words, it's discouraged, shall, shall be rare and approved by the principal and designee. And then we'd also refer down to, of course, the guidelines document that parents can look to to determine what would be appropriate. So last call for any questions. Well, can I, Mrs. So Franklin? I, I actually, this was part of the School Health Advisory Committee. And there, I guess, uh, during the discussion, during the committee meeting, um, it was, uh, I guess, there were a few people that felt like discouraged was too strong, which is the reason they changed it to rare. Um, but I will actually be talking about that in a little, little bit more in the committee notes. But that's pretty much the reason why they changed that verbiage. All right, with that then, um, all in favor, show a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have nine ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. That brings us to committee organization and board reports. Who would like to start? Mrs. Franklin, you're still on, sorry. Um, and I, I'm just, I know this is going to take a little bit, but I thought that this was very good information. Let me just start with Gift to CAC. We actually had our final meeting of the year, and I just want to thank the board members for reviewing all of the candidates for members um, and uh, for entrusting the, the committee to, to look at those and propose those. Um, and we also at the board meeting or at the committee meeting also um, voted for the new leaders as well, new positions. So, uh, so thank you to, the, or congratulations to the new um, president, which I believe is Jennifer, and I cannot remember her last name, so I apologize, Jennifer. But um, at the School Health Advisory Committee, we actually had, I was filling in for Ms. Weems, so thank you very much, because it was a really interesting committee meeting. Um, uh, and it was also the last meeting of the year. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, so many things that I, I had not known before. On the Food Service website, there are videos um, with information about you know nu nutrition and um, preparation and things like that. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, <laughs> one thing that I thought was also very interesting is that they have a birthday tab on the Virginia Beach site under food services, which includes the cost and items if you want to have birthday celebrations um, that are provided through food services. I think that's really important because I think that a lot of people, um, you know, to avoid the, the concern of bringing outside food and drink, you know, it's good to know that they have this available. So if you do want to have a birthday celebration, you can um, request it through food services as well. Um, and one thing that they also had recommended, one of the nurses, they said to encourage potentially using excess recess for reward, birthday rewards um, and discourage eating as a reward, which I probably am a, not a good example of that, bringing my Krispy Kreme donuts. But, um, <laughs> but I, I know, so I probably need some training on that as well. But... Um, <laughs> But it was rare. It was rare, exactly. Maybe not. I don't know. But but anyway, but uh, uh, teachers and professionals really want to encourage learning about how um, using food as a reward can be harmful to children. So maybe looking at other options to uh, celebrate birthdays and that sort of thing. Um, another thing that I thought was very helpful was the mental health building is open and inpatient, inpatient beds are going to be open as of early October, and there is going to be a community event starting September for open house of the building. Um, I can't read my own handwriting, but uh, so that basically there's going to be 60 beds per mental health hospitals. So um, just again, some really, really good information. I'm actually going to be posting a little bit more on this as well, but um, thank you again. I thought it was a very great committee meeting. So, And Mrs. Weems. Yes, that is that is a great committee to be on with all the expertise from CHKD and, and Mary Shaw did a great job and now Heidi's doing a great job with that committee. And they spent so much time on this one policy about the outside food, you know, sending it back and forth that we really spent a lot of time on that. Um, all right, so I um, attended the last SEAC Special Education Advisory Committee um, meeting for the year today. 
And next, at our next meeting, um, Dr. Myers Daub and Ms. McGuire, the president of SEAC, will be presenting the um, special education report. So we'll, we're anxious to, to um, review and hear that. Um, they've got uh, five subcommittees going on, and they're really working hard, especially their outreach committee. Um, one of the um, things that they're changing up a little bit, the meetings used to be on Mondays at 930 in the morning, but next year they're going to flip it. They're going to have a morning meeting and then a night meeting and then a morning meeting and an evening meeting um, in, in hopes of getting more people because a lot of working parents cannot come. Um, at evening you have the child care issue too, So, but they're just going to kind of flip it to try to get more people um, involved and, and more people able to come. So again, a great meeting and a great year for our SEAC um, volunteers. We really appreciate you guys. Thank you, Mrs. Weems. Have that on the send. Okay, Mrs. Melnick. The next audit committee meeting is June 30th. Uh, governance and the retreat schedule. Uh, it's pretty firmed up, uh, but as you're all aware, we're, we're looking to fine tune the time period for one of the pieces of the retreat, and then we'll be able to lock in uh, an end time for the second day of the retreat, and that should come shortly because that was contingent on uh, a, a committee, a work group meeting, which they have. So I'll follow up on that. But but it's, but, but for the most part, the, the uh, certainly the two the location, the two dates, and the uh, the time. Ninety five percent of it is all locked in right now. Anybody else? Okay, then I just want to end with a note that with the school year concluding, I just want to thank each and every one of you for your committee work and, and your attendance with these outside organizations so that we are we, we re remain visible out there in the community. And, and we should be very proud of all that the work our committees do um, for on behalf of the board. Go ahead, Mrs. Anderson. So um, uh, Ms. Franklin and I met <clears throat> in the uh, with the employee input process we had our first meeting and uh, we actually came up with several interesting ideas uh, which nothing has been firmed up yet but we we had a great discussion lots of ideas were put out there and um, we'll we'll be getting more to the board next month I think after we well actually probably during our retreat I think we're gonna present some things okay and mrs. Williams no, no, no. I'll feel like, yes, we, we touched on that in admin matters. Thank you. <laughs> All right, then. So that wraps up uh, that. And we will now, uh, item 17, return to the informal meeting for our final presentation <clears throat> our professional development update. And welcome, Ms. Gorham. Ms. Gorham, just put the microphone on. Thank you. I have not been here in a while. <laughs> um, good evening, Chairman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the board, and Dr. Spence. My name is Janine Gorham, and I'm the Director of the Office of Professional Growth and Innovation. Today's workshop will provide an update on professional learning for the 2021-22 school year and a preview of upcoming professional learning for the 2022-23 school year. Professional learning is a responsibility shared among all central support departments, as well as with our school leaders, and I'm proud to be able to share our collective work. I would like to start by framing teacher professional learning. The Virginia Standards of Quality require divisions to provide a professional learning program to not only support staff's licensure requirements, but as an important lever for a high quality instructional program. Several years ago, for the 2018-2019 school year, we shifted the focus of our professional learning program to be less about compliance and accumulating points and more about ensuring that all teachers have the necessary foundational learning experiences with personalized opportunities for ongoing support and enrichment. Our professional learning program, commonly referred to as PLP, consists of three main components. Essential professional learning are required activities differentiated by teaching assignment. Prior to 2018, we required 22 points annually 
And now we require what is essential for specific teaching assignments. Choice sessions are those that extend learning from essential sessions and serve to build capacity based on individual needs. To give you an idea of the volume of instructional professional learning for just those two categories, essential and choice, this year we provided 1,227 activities with 25,832 enrollments. That equates to 5,963 staff members who participated. The third component of PLP is site-based professional learning. These activities are determined by the school principal and designed to align to the needs of the school and the individual needs of teachers. I feel it is important to note how critical site -based, the site-based component of the professional learning program is because that's where ongoing support occurs, whether it is through coaching, collaboration during professional learning communities or PLCs, or when the Department of Teaching and Learning coordinators and specialists push into buildings to provide support. To summarize and connect all three components, you can consider the essentials, the foundation that launches additional learning determined by individual teacher need or school need, which might be provided through site-based professional learning or through division choice sessions. In addition to our professional learning program, which support supports the point requirements necessary for license holders to renew, there are also legislated requirements. These external requirements are tied to an individual license, such as the child abuse and neglect training, dyslexia awareness, first aid, hands-on CPR, and AED. There are other requirements that are for the divisions to provide training. For example, new this upcoming school year, all school-based staff that have regular interactions with students, which is essentially all of them, must complete an online on-demand module from the Epilepsy Foundation to raise awareness for how to respond and support students who may have a seizure disorder. So let's take a look back at this year's essential requirements. Essential professional learning typically occurs in the summer because by definition, they focus on topics necessary for the upcoming school year. These typically are related to updates to curriculum, standards, new resources, programs, technology applications, or the introduction or reinforcement of instructional strategies based on student data or driven by our strategic goals. The examples you see on this slide are not all of the essential requirements, but do show how sessions are designed for specific teaching assignments, often down to the course, ensuring relevancy and intentional planning planning for what is needed for that specific group of teachers. COVID did have an impact on professional learning this year due to the challenge of increased workloads, mitigation strategies, staffing challenges, and substitute availability. We did have to pull back or modify our plans by either postponing or reverting to online asynchronous learning, which while it did meet the immediate need and provide necessary flexibility, it is not comparable to live interactive professional learning. Despite these challenges, we did have many notable accomplishments that are a credit to the dedication of our staff. We continued meeting with principals and APs at our quarterly citywide leadership meetings, ensuring that progress continued to be made towards the goals of our Compass to 2025. 77 staff members attended a series of trauma-sensitive sessions offered in collaboration with the Virginia Department of Education's Virginia Tiered Systems of Support. We provided letters professional learning to 200 teachers this year, and we'll have a cohort of over 330 next year. The final four bullets reflect our commitment and investment in our grow our own programs, promoted and all funded by Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Our latest cohort of aspiring administrators completed their second year of their two-year program. And if you look closely at the picture on the slide, for a second, you will probably recognize some familiar faces because many of the cohort of 16 have moved into administrative positions. Through a partnership with ODU, TriIT provides the coursework that have enabled nine teachers and four TAs this year to earn their special education endorsement. For TAs, that means they are provisionally licensed and can be hired to serve as special education teachers next year. 30 teachers participated in the ESL Praxis cohort. All 30 have passed their exam 
and are currently interviewing to be included in the applicant pool for next year. 50 participants completed college courses to support their gifted endorsement, a requirement for teachers at Old Donation and our gifted resource teachers. While we didn't have the volume of professional learning activities that we normally do, we took advantage of time this year to listen and learn from our stakeholders. This spring, we created a professional learning advisory board for assistant principals. 18 of our APs and academy coordinators expressed interest and were selected to serve on the board to help shape new solutions for their own professional learning. Teacher Assembly is a representative body that meets quarterly to provide insight, input, and feedback on a variety of topics. In October, representatives had the opportunity to give feedback through a survey and one-on-one -on -one listening sessions with members of our SEL implementation team to learn more about teacher needs with regards to supporting SEL of students. We learned many things, but one actionable item was that teachers shared they would like to have more examples of how to support social emotional skill development during academic instruction. As a result, we are facilitating an SEL integration fellows cohort to gather quality SEL examples that could be linked into our curriculum. And finally, our elementary department of teaching and learning works closely with teachers, which affords them close proximity to ongoing feedback. Based on that feedback, in 2021-22, this year, instead of a four-hour essential session front-loaded in the summer, they offered a series beginning with a summer session and then short quarterly sessions. During the year, they monitored the effectiveness of this approach and decided to adjust again for the upcoming year with a more job-embedded approach that leverages the coaches in schools through grade-level collaboration meetings. Learning will be ongoing and embedded rather than separate standalone sessions. So let's turn our attention to the upcoming year. And as we did previously, we will begin with what is required. As you can see from this representative sampling of the essential requirements, there is a focus on strengthening instructional practice, responding to student needs and curriculum updates and resources. Again, the majority of these sessions occur during the summer months or during in-service week so that teachers may be prepared for the school year. You will recall that the second component of our professional learning program is choice. And while these learning opportunities are offered throughout the year and are often geared towards specific teaching assignments, I'm sharing some examples for the summer of broad opportunities for all teachers and administrators. These conference style events offer a professional experience with opportunities to learn from experts, colleagues, and network with their peers. In addition to these conference style events, we are also excited to share information about support for Canvas. As you know, we are transitioning from Schoology, Schoology to Canvas beginning in September for all course grades K through 12. The instructional technology team will be hosting Camp Canvas one day in June and one day in August. These events will provide learners with everything that they need to effectively implement Canvas starting day one of the new school year. Sessions will be workshop style and will provide clarity of the aspects of Canvas and how best to use, as well as to provide time to practice new skills. In addition to the Growing with Canvas course and Camp Canvas, learners have a variety of learning opportunities within the training services portal. In this portal, teachers will find a learning library and calendar that includes live webinars, asynchronous courses, and programs. Instructional technology specialists will also provide ongoing, just-in-time support for teachers during the school year. Just as the Summer Essential Professional Learning prepares teachers for the school year, the Summer Leadership Conference does the same for our school administrators. Sessions are aligned to the goals of the strategic framework with the theme of creating an optimal learning and working environment in which all staff and students feel seen, heard, known, and loved, cultivating a sense of belonging and inclusion, and celebrating the actions of students and staff that exemplify our core values. Learning continues throughout the year at our quarterly citywide meetings for both principals and assistant principals and through optional summer short courses. And in the fall, we are looking forward to welcoming 28 teachers to our new cohort of aspiring administrators and 22 assistant principals for a cohort of aspiring principals. 
I want to close by sharing information regarding professional learning for non-instructional staff members who have opportunities to support their growth to be the best at their current positions and learning for career advancement. Job-specific skills are addressed through departments that support or oversee those employees. For example, the Office of Purchasing provides ongoing training to bookkeepers, and the Office of Transportation supports bus drivers. Power skills are the skills and competencies that enable you to be impactful and successful at your job, which are skills that cross all job categories. One of the ways that we support staff with developing power skills is through on-demand learning, that provides these employees an opportunities to learn right at their desk, on their bus, or while taking a walk on their lunch break. We have a very popular learning on the go collection of 31 audio podcasts addressing a variety of topics related to communication, collaboration, and time management. During the past year, we had a total of 822 enrollments. In addition, in partnership with the Department of Technology, we are promoting Udemy, an online learning platform that enables staff to have access to thousands of courses. On the slide, you can see the course we are featuring this month. The Department of Technology has offered this resource to their department in the spring we have expanded its use to other staff members. We traditionally have a large volume of professional learning focused on supporting needs of students, but the majority of that learning has been targeted towards instructional staff. This coming year, our professional growth and innovation team is pushing into training for custodians, bus drivers, nurses, office staff, and other non-instructional staff because their relationships and interactions with students are critical components of the positive and supporting environment we want for all students and staff. And finally, leadership development isn't just for school administrators. After pausing for two years, we are excited to return this summer to offering leadership and management for custodial staff. This six session series builds the leadership capacity so they can be successful in supervisory positions. We are planning to resume the leadership and management series for cafeteria staff this fall and are currently planning similar programs for maintenance services in the Department of Technology. In addition, we have increased our efforts to support central office leaders. This spring, division directors had an opportunity to participate in a book study on the leadership book multipliers, and we'll have an opportunity for summer learning activities as well. The Department of Teaching and Learning is also creating an internal leader academy to support their existing staff and those who are just making the transition from the classroom to the department with new responsibilities. And at this time, I will take any questions that you may have. We'll start with Mrs. Melnick. I don't have a question, because I always try to find some great stuff in everything we do. Can you go back to slide one? Well, slide two. Oh. Not, not the. Which one? It's the one that showed. It's slide number two that showed all of the participants. OK. So as a board, we need to be really happy about this because <clears throat> we don't have mandatory points anymore. And <laughs> look at those numbers. Like, so you would think without mandatory, of course, we, we assume they're going to do the essentials. But to see those numbers speaks volumes for our teachers, for our employees, that they still want to learn and grow in in their profession and and that right there should be plastered everywhere that's kudos kudos to our employees that's that's really great mrs thank you mrs franklin um thank you for this presentation i just have i'm curious uh, i'm excited that we are offering the leadership and management series to uh, custodial staff cafeteria staff um, and how is that information getting disseminated to them so that they're, you know, fully aware and you know engaged in in this opportunity? So we communicate through principals and our supervisors and the department also reach out and talk directly okay. um, to to the employees. Okay. Yeah, I'll be interested in seeing how many actually take advantage. We, of that. We've had this. Um, we've paused for two years, but prior to that, we were doing at least two cohorts of custodians every year. Oh for several years and at least one of cafeteria. So we're really excited to get back to, to doing it. Okay, very good. Thank you. 
Mrs. Felton. Just want to make a statement, and I think Mrs. Uh, Franklin hit on it. I'm just excited that you have this engagement with our um, custodians, bus drivers, uh, workers, because um, you did say the way you talk about how they interact with our students, and when you when we when you go to the different events that they're there, the custodians said these are my children, these are my students, and I was I just attended Selim. Um, high school um, academy program that they had. And what the student did, they, they didn't choose as some random person, but they chose people from uh, the custodial records, cafeteria records, to introduce them, introduce their works and what they had done. So I'm really excited about this incentive, incentive that you're giving them. This is a, a, a way of us keeping our people here as well and letting them know that we do appreciate them. We are just making our family and our community strong within the schools. Thank you so much for this. I'm looking forward to seeing the fruits of our labor that comes out of this. Thank you. Okay, I think, I think we'll, okay, Mrs. Anderson. Um, on slide nine, where you talk, about, I'm sorry, slide 10, I mean, I mean. Uh, where you talk about choice professional learning for Canvas. Yes. Um, that That's so important. Is that going to be mandatory? But their choice is when they take it? The uh, Camp Canvas is not mandatory. Um, our teachers have the Growing with Canvas class. They have been taking that as kind of their, their essential learning for Canvas. Okay. That this is a choice for those who want to come in the summer to get a little deeper dive into Canvas. Okay. And is there a, um, a cutoff on how many you can accommodate? Um, I am not sure. And I think Dr. Shoebridge, um, who was organizing that, um, already left. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I can find out. Okay. Unless um, you know I think I think it's important. The email actually went out just a little while ago to promote it. It did. We didn't cap that off, <laughs> Mrs. Anderson. It is a conference style, so there will be a number of opportunities for staff to participate in. It does run the course pretty much all day from 8 to 4 o'clock p.m. Okay. So there will be uh, multiple opportunities for staff to choose. So, for example, there could be a, a Camp Canvas 101 a uh, course that will be offered multiple times throughout the course of that day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then August 11th is there, but the first one is June, I can't remember, June, June 23rd. So it's a repeat, so we will not be turning uh, folks away if they want to participate. Great. Yeah. Um, do, will they get professional points for that? Yes, How many professional points? It's based mm. on based on the amount of time that they attend. So if they come for just maybe an hour or two in the morning, they get their one or two points. If they stay the whole day, they would get points related to the amount of time that they spend. Okay, that sounds good. Um, yes. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's important that, that as many people uh, participate with this as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. The training portal has a, a wide variety of activities. Some are real short, like 15 mm -hmm. minutes, and they're longer, and they do get recertification points for that as well. And that's virtual? Yes, so it's okay. on demand. They do have some live webinars, some recorded, and then there are lots of modules. Thanks. And you're going, because we can see it. It's awesome. Mrs. Riggs? I just want to add um, the different newsletters that I'm getting and that I get from different principals. Um, they are, they've been advertising that, and that's one of the things they advertised on their newsletter this last week and this last month uh, to their teachers about the um, the new Canvas training. Personally, if it was me, I'd be in both of them all day long. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to be. So I, I'm, I'm very appreciative that you guys are are um, offering that. I'm sure they are too. Thank you. Okay, final call. All right, we thank you very much and, and our thanks to all this, our teachers and others who are taking advantage of these great opportunities. Okay, so uh, Dr. Spence. Yes, ma'am. Madam Chair, I know you all are getting ready to uh, go into closed just before you did that because I know we will then adjourn after that and I wanted to make sure I had the chance to do this as well. Dr. Parrott is with us. You all know because you got the memo that Dr. Parrott's going to be leaving and transitioning to a new role. And I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge her leadership as well as our director for DEI. And we want to thank you for all the work that you've done to 
move us through this assessment and move us closer towards this plan. And I know she's going to be working uh, with the Equity Administrative Planning Committee, and we'll see them through their last meeting on June 22nd before she assumes a new position. So thank you so much for everything that you've done for us as well. We appreciate you. All right, so now I'm going to, Mrs. Melnick, would you please read us into closed session? I move that the school board recess into closed session to deliberate on the following matters. Into a closed meeting pursuant to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by section 2.2-3711 part A paragraphs 1, 7, and 8 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended for a1, discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body, namely A, discussion with regarding to the superintendent's employment contract terms, B, appointment of citizen members to school board citizen advisory committees effective July 1st, 2022. A7, Consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. For the purpose of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or on which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. An A8, <clears throat> consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter namely to discuss status of pending litigation and new litigation matters. A second. Mrs. Riggs, all in favor, show a raised hand. We have eight ayes. Motion did pass to go into closed. Okay, thank you. We're back in open session. Ms. Melnick, would you please Whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and two, only public business matters which were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. Okay, motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs and a second. Mrs. Anderson, all in favor, show a raised hand, please. We have eight ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. Now I make I make I make the following motion that the chair is authorized to sign an amendment to the superintendent's employment contract to extend his term of employment from July 1, 2022 to June 30th, 2026. Second? Second. Mrs. Uh, Anderson? Okay, uh, all in favor show a raised hand. All those hands went up and she picked Bev. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we have seven eyes. <clears throat> all all opposed? And we have one nay, so the motion did pass, 7-1-0. Okay. 
I, and I'm, okay, and then number two, I move that the superintendent is authorized to undertake paid employment with the American Association of Superintendents through AASA through his private consulting business through February 2024. A second? Second. Mrs. Franklin. <laughs> All in favor, show a raised hand. We have eight ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you all. So we are now adjourned. All right. Now, do we need to pop in to Aaron real quick? Okay. Let's